Well, hello, everybody. My name is Will Marshall. I'm president of the Progressive Policy Institute in Washington. And welcome to today's webinar on ending the hunger crisis, lessons from the COVID pandemic. You know, even before uh, the pandemic struck, uh, something like 37 million Americans, including 11 million children, uh, reported being hungry from time to time, or, uh, having uh, not good nutrition. And of course, pandemic has made everything worse. It's magnified all of our social problems and all of our social inequities in a big way. And one of the worst things that, to happen from the vantage point of hunger was the closing of schools. Uh, obviously, lots of kids get their uh, get meals there. 27 million get in the school lunch program, 15 million in school breakfasts. And all of a sudden, with schools shutting down just about this time a year ago, maybe a little late, a couple of weeks later, but. Uh, they found that uh, they, they couldn't get that food. There was a lot of mad improvising, you know, with districts uh, setting up grab and, go, grab and go programs and getting their uh, idle school buses out delivering meals to folks. But uh, as my PPI colleague, Crystal Swan, uh, reported uh, this summer, about 80% of the districts said that they were feeding uh, for fewer students. Uh, now, in contrast to the his predecessor's rather feeble response to this emergency, President Biden has done a lot in just, well, he's been 47 days in office, and uh, uh, he's, he's already issued executive orders to, uh, to in increase the uh, pandemic uh, food uh, uh, assistance program and do other important things. And this week, we hope he will sign the big uh, American rescue plan. Looks like it's going to get through Congress when Folks in the House are done with it, and uh, 8 $1.8 trillion, a massive uh, bill that also uh, extends uh, the increase in food stamp benefits. So uh, that's really crucial, uh, and it's going to help millions of Americans who need it right away. But looking beyond the immediate crisis, uh, my colleague Veronica Goodman and Crystal Swan have written a report that calls for a more a comprehensive response, federal response. Uh, to the problem and, and looks at some structural uh, barriers to food access and affordability that you know, we ought to, uh, we ought to uh, think about as we go forward. Um, and uh, the, with the idea of making our food and nutrition systems more resilient against the next pandemic or some future national uh, uh, emergency. Uh, to get our conversation started today, we are very fortunate to have a very special guest. She is uh, Representative Suzanne Abonamichi. She's emerged as one of the leading anti-hunger voices in, in Congress. And uh, following some remarks by her, which I'll set up in just a second, we're going to hear from a distinguished group of leading hunger experts and analysts around the country, uh, Mary Hendrickson, Lauren Bauer, uh, and uh, Joel Berg, and I just have to pause and say that uh, Joel is CEO of Hunger Free America, and I, and I have to, uh, uh, to let the world know that he, he, he sort of started his Washington career many eons ago at the Progressive Policy Institute, uh, and like so many uh, folks, has eclipsed you know, the, the, the organization, and he's now my mentor on uh, food and nutrition. Uh, issues. So thanks, Joel, for being with us. But uh, why don't you get us started, uh, Congresswoman Bonamici? Again, uh, you, I haven't said it, but you represent the uh, Oregon one, the first district of Oregon, a coastal district since uh, uh, 2012. Uh, she has been a leader on a whole host of issues in the Congress, in the House. Uh, she's on the Education and Labor Committee, and she chairs the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Human Services. And I have a feeling if we weren't in a pandemic, you might be on the Pettus Bridge in Alabama uh, again this year, as you were last year with John Lewis. Also on the Climate Science and Technology uh, Special Committee that's been set up. But for our purposes today, she is the uh, sponsor of several major anti-hunger bills, including uh, uh, the Pandemic Child Hunger Prevention Act, which she uh, put in last summer. And then just in January, the School uh, Recovery uh, Food Act looks at the fascinating issue of, of uh, food waste in America and in our schools and how to reduce it. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us. Please uh, give us your reflections on what we've learned about hunger and food insecurity from this terrible year of pandemic. 
Well, thank you so much, Will, and Progressive Policy Institute, thank you for the invitation. Veronica, thank you for your leadership and all of you who are joining us uh, and for organizing this discussion about our nation's food insecurity issues uh, and importantly, the lessons we have learned uh, during the pandemic. And I wanna start by acknowledging just how difficult the past year has been for our country uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and particularly for individuals and families who were already experiencing poverty and food insecurity. We know the pandemic has exacerbated inequities in many areas and this is one. No one should go hungry in the United States and yet we know that far too many of our neighbors are facing hunger. And before the pandemic, roughly 15 million households faced food insecurity, including one in five children in my home state of Oregon who lived in a household where financial hardship made it difficult to put food on the table. And we also know that uh, addressing hunger, it's a racial justice issue as well. Because of systemic racism, including a persistent wage gap for black workers and workers of color, black children are twice as likely as their peers to face hunger, making it critical to center racial justice and the experiences of black families in our work to combat hunger. As you note in your paper, these um, low-income individuals living in rural areas where there are food deserts also suffer disproportionately from food insecurity. And I wanna note that you know, there used to be this perception that food insecurity was an urban issue and it's an issue everywhere, urban, suburban, rural. Uh, now we're in the midst of this devastating global pandemic. All of the numbers are much worse. With, with, as I mentioned, existing inequities exacerbated. <clears throat> and now there's so many more families struggling because of unemployment and unexpected financial distress. And we've seen a massive increase in individuals reaching out to food banks. It's especially important to maintain and expand access at this time in our country. And I've worked hard during the pandemic to provide relief through the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, the CARES Act and the end of year spending deal. And now, uh, finally, the American Rescue Plan. So I'm, as you heard in that kind introduction, I'm chair of the Civil Rights and Human Services Subcommittee on the Education Labor Committee. And one of the issues I focused on is making sure that all children have access to nutritious meals. We know that school meals are the primary source of nutrition for many children. Before the pandemic, our public schools were serving meals to more than 29 million students and nearly 22 million of those students received free or reduced price lunches. The Families First Act included my bipartisan bill to protect access to the school meals during school building closures because of COVID-19. This bill was enacted quickly. After the first school closures, it provided that critical flexibility at the beginning of the pandemic to make it easier for schools to continue operating meal programs. And I went to visit some of them in Northwest Oregon, where they were really making a difference with our, our families. So throughout the crisis, I've spoken with Oregonians and then with people across the country about how important it is for schools and for families to have that flexibility in the meal program. I've heard stories of innovation. Some school districts were using their idle buses to deliver meals because not everybody can drive or get to a place, uh, a school site where they're um, located. Last Congress, as you heard, I also co-led a bill with Chairman Scott, Chairman of the Education Committee. This is the Pandemic Child Hunger Prevention Act that would allow all children to access breakfast, lunch, and after-school snack programs, either in school or through grab and grow, excuse me, grab and go uh, and delivery options. So the COVID relief that Congress passed last year included several important provisions, protect college student eligibility for SNAP. I'm always uh, astounded, but uh, concerned about how many college students are facing food and housing insecurity. Uh, we created and expanded the pandemic EBT program that's been critical for children living in both urban and rural communities, streamlining access to WIC, supporting food banks, and providing emergency relief to school meal and the child and adult care food program, something that I've been worked on, worked on for years. <clears throat> I also held a roundtable discussion in November I heard directly from hunger advocates and individuals, including several college students, as I mentioned, who are experiencing food insecurity. One student told me about dropping out because of homelessness and hunger. Uh, one said something about being one flat tire away from hunger. Another student spoke about helping to put food on the table for her siblings while attending class full time. And an Oregon food bank volunteer told me about an older gentleman standing in line at a food pantry and it was in tears. And he was saying, please don't think I do this every day. 
just a sad, sad story um, about you know, the, the feeling that people are getting when they, they, they need to reach out sometimes for the first time because they've lost their job. This, these conversations help illustrate that although the aid and flexibility we provided is helping, we know our work is not done and we're far from solving this crisis within a crisis. So I mentioned the American Rescue Plan. This bill will provide additional resources to help individuals and families get through the pandemic. We expect to pass it very soon, as early as tomorrow in the House. And it's already passed the House, gone to the Senate. The Senate made some changes. We're expecting to pass it as early as tomorrow. This is going to improve WIC benefits, provide funding to modernize the program, extend pandemic EBT benefits to the summer, extends the 15% increase in SNAP benefits through September 30th, and provides $37 million for the Commodity Supplemental Food Program to help low-income seniors. So there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we're still in the tunnel, but the light is getting brighter and we know we still have a way to go and, and that individuals and families need our continued support. <clears throat> I also want to mention part of the really critical part of the American uh, Rescue Plan is the child tax credit as well that's really going to help families with children. So people across the country are really in these terrible, uh, facing these terrible choices right now. Um, whether they, they pay the rent, put food on the table, pay the rent, uh, pay the, um, uh, for, for uh, student loans or other expenses that they have. It's really tough and they're demanding action. So we have a responsibility to get this relief done. It's urgent that Congress pass this package and I'm looking forward to voting for it soon. We hope to continue work in, in this Congress on addressing food insecurity, because as we know, the, the issue predated the pandemic. I'm going to be reintroducing a bill I worked on with Representative Takano, who's the chair of the Veterans Committee, that was included as an amendment to the College Affordability Act. That's the Opportunity to Address College Hunger Act. This part of the bill will make sure food insecure students who are eligible for SNAP are aware of their eligibility and have the support they need to secure the benefits. This was drafted in response to concerns I heard from Oregon community colleges and universities. <laughs> about students still struggling with food and housing insecurity. I also hope we can work to strengthen programs under the Child Nutrition Act to make sure that younger students and families using WIC have access to the nutri uh, nutrition they need. I'm a big fan of the Farm to School program and a lot of other programs that help uh, ha get healthy food to our communities. I know we have more work to do to slow the spread of the virus to get individuals and families who are struggling uh, the help they need and to stabilize the economy and support small businesses. I will continue to advocate for policy solutions that will increase and improve economic stability and also strengthen our food system during the crisis and beyond. So thank you again for inviting me to speak with you today. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for all of your work and research on this very important issue. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks so much, uh, Congresswoman, for those inspiring remarks. May I ask you one quick question before you go? I know you of have course. to go. Uh, are the schools in your district open or are they opening? Well, I have 25 school districts in the congressional district I, I represent, uh, and a couple of them are open. They're smaller districts. Uh, they are phasing into opening. It, it should be by next month. Uh, we want them to have the resources they need to open safely, and that's part of the American Rescue Plan, because a lot of schools just don't have the ventilation, the space, the support. So we're going to get this over the finish line, and as, as our educators get vaccinated, and we all want our students back in school, it's so important. Uh, we're going to see that happening soon. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks a lot. Well, Thank you. again, really uh, love hearing from you today, uh, uh, Suzanne Bonamici. Thank you very much for being with us. So uh, with that great send uh, uh, kickoff, let me uh, turn to my colleague, uh, Veronica Goodman, who directs social policy at PPI to introduce our, our, our guests and uh, to continue this conversation. Veronica, over to you. Thank you, Will. Um, hi, everyone, and, and welcome again to our webinar. Um, I'm Veronica Goodman, the Director of Social Policy at PPI, and I'll be moderating our panel discussion today. I first want to thank Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici for her wonderful remarks to open up this event, um, but also for her tireless advocacy in Congress on behalf of millions of Americans who are suffering from food insecurity. And thank you, of course, to our panelists and everyone joining today for our webinar on ending the hunger crisis, lessons from the pandemic, and structural solutions to food insecurity. Um, to start, I want to um, just take a moment to share the catalyst for this event. 
my colleague, Crystal Swan, uh, and I recently published a paper with policy recommendations um, for a comprehensive federal approach to the hunger crisis. We felt that now that we're a year into the pandemic, lessons have been learned for better or worse on how to feed our communities. And I see this conversation as an opportunity to reflect and develop ideas for moving forward. To give some numbers to the scale of the problem, America's hunger crisis is now so acute that a recent analysis by the Center on Budget looking at census data found that the number of children not getting enough to eat was 10 times higher during the pandemic, while nearly 24 million Americans reported that their, their households did not have enough to eat. So this is a timely and important subject and I'm excited to get started. Our panelists today reflect different areas of food and hunger policy and we're very grateful to all of them for joining us. I'm very much so looking forward to their remarks. I'll introduce each of them now. They'll speak on their respective areas of expertise and then we'll do some follow-up questions before we turn it over to Crystal Swan, my colleague um, from a Q&A from the audience. Um, and just a quick note that if you're on Twitter, the hashtag for the event is end hunger. First, we have Joel Berg, who is CEO of Hunger Free America and a nationally recognized leader and spokesperson for domestic hunger and food security. He's the author of the book, All You Can Eat, How Hungry is America? And I would be remiss if I did not mention again that he is a PPI alum from many moons ago. Uh, we also have Lauren Bauer joining us. She's a fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution. Her research focuses on social and safety net policies, including federal nutrition assistance programs and education. And third, we have Mary Hendrickson, who is an associate professor of rural sociology at the University of Missouri, and she serves as co-director of the Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security. Through her research, teaching, and outreach, she seeks to build resilient, food-secure communities across Missouri and beyond. Um, last year, she was a Fulbright Scholar to Iceland, teaching sustainable agriculture. And from 1997 to 2012, she worked to create local food systems in Missouri as an extension sociologist, gaining valuable on-the-ground experience and transforming food systems. So thank you to our three very impressive panels today. We're uh, very much so looking forward to a stimulating discussion. Uh, first, we'll hear from Joel. Take it away, Joel. Well, thank you, Veronica. Thank you, Well, It's always great to be back at a PPI event. It's where I cut my teeth learning how to be a great radical centrist pragmatist, uh, which I, I still am uh, you know, uh, today. And, and I think you know, the proposal I worked on with PPI on the HOPE proposal really is radical centrism. It's about a fundamental change in the way we conduct social policy, but based on mainstream values in a way that can get the buy-in of all sectors of American society. Progressives should like it uh, and liberals should like it because it increases access to safety net programs and uh, you know, legitimate, uh, conscientious, consistent conservatives should like it because it could eventually reduce the size of government bureaucracies. And so that proposal proposal in a nutshell has two segments to it. One, to make it easier for people to apply online for a wide variety of anti-hunger and anti-poverty benefits. And two, to allow low-income people to voluntarily create action plans to set benchmarks for the future, to save money, to put a down payment on a house, to start a, a business, to advance their educations, but that they would have extra matching funds put into this by the government or nonprofit sector and very revolutionary uh, in its nature is they would have equal say with the government and with the nonprofit sector in having agency over their own future. And I, why I think these proposals are important is for the last few decades, we've had sort of a consensus. We won't let too many people starve at once, but we really won't significantly end food insecurity and we won't allow a lot of people to move towards self-sufficiency. And we've really had the casework management idea that every low-income person sort of needs to be case managed. And the technology revolution that's changed so many of our lives has not changed the lives of low-income people as much as it needs to be. If you need 10 different government benefits, you may still have to go to eight different government offices. And so that's why I put this in the context of the current hunger crisis we have. You know, some estimates say it tops 50 million Americans now that can't always afford enough uh, food, uh, a massive collapse in the economy. And while it's recovered at the top, it's not recovered uh, for a large segment of American workers. As the Congresswoman said, this is an urban, suburban and rural issue. In fact, the largest number of hungry Americans in the country are working 
uh, people in suburbs because suburbs have the largest number of people in poverty now, have the largest number of people in this country now. So it really defies stereotype. While systemic racism is a key cause of this and people of color are disproportionately likely to be hungry and uh, African-American households are twice as likely as white households to be food insecure, the largest number of Americans who are food insecure now are white. And that's an important thing to understand. The largest number of Americans who get SNAP are white. The number, largest number of Americans who live in poverty are white because so much of this really, of the other side, frankly, is a bit of race baiting, implying that only other people need this help. Uh, this is also a very feminized issue. We run the National Hunger Hotline on behalf of USDA. Uh, something like 70 to 80% of the people call are female. Households headed by single women are three times as likely as households overall to be food insecure. This is also a disability rights issue. Just people with disabilities are disproportionately likely to be hungry. And the solution really is radical centrism, creating an inclusive economy where jobs pay a living wage. And I don't know how long, you know, Will's been talking about making work pay uh, even longer than I knew him. And that should be the centerpiece of American social policy. And then we need an adequate safety net when that's not enough. And I am thrilled by the steps the uh, Biden administration has taken out of the box. We don't talk about the anti-hunger provisions enough of the tax policy, but cutting child poverty in half through the tax credits will dramatically reduce child hunger. So uh, after many years in the wilderness, we're not out of it yet. We still have very great challenges, but we do have some really helpful signs. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Joel, for, for those sweeping remarks. Um, now we will turn to uh, Lauren. All right, we're going to try to share a screen here. See how it goes. Can you see it? Yeah, great. Um, okay, so uh, in the US, food insecurity and economic hardship typically increase in recessions and decrease in economic expansions. And the COVID-19 recession is no different. So in 2019, before the pandemic hit, about 11% of households and somewhat more share of households with kids experienced food insecurity. But the experience of hunger among children themselves was not zero, but it was, it was rare. Um, and then the pandemic hit and food insecurity skyrocketed. But at the beginning of 2021, we are hopefully turning a corner. So as of the first half of February, about one in five respondents to the Census Household Pulse Survey, which is how we are tracking what is happening in American families right now, reported that their households are food insecure. And about one in four parents with children at home do. But typically, families experiencing food insecurity are able to protect their children from it, but the pandemic has made that really hard. The evidence is clear that parents have struggled to make ends meet to put food on the table. So as of January of this year, about 15% of households with at least one school-aged child and shockingly 8% of households with only children five and under report that their children don't have enough to eat and they don't have the resources to purchase more food. Black and Hispanic households with children are reporting provocative and what should be galvanizing levels of food insecurity. But again, I am tentatively hopeful that rates are starting to come down. So what has helped? The answer is longer than I'm gonna talk about here, but I hope we get to it in Q&A. Um, but I'd like to briefly discuss um, two policies, um, both of which the Congresswoman referenced earlier, pandemic EBT and the maximum benefit increase to SNAP. So pandemic EBT is a program that Congress authorized in Families First to replace missed prepared school meals with a grocery store voucher. And with my colleagues, Diane Schonzenbach, Krista Ruffini and Abigail Pitts, we evaluated the effect of pandemic EBT on measures of food hardship as it rolled out over last summer. And what we found is that it was quite effective. Households reported that their children did not have need, enough to eat. It reduced by 30% when PEBT rolled out. So Congress reauthorized the program it's been included as a um, included its uh, summer extension as well as extending as long as a public health emergency has been declared um, is in the American Rescue Plan, and it also has a central place in the Biden administration's anti hunger agenda. This is well warranted and evidence based, but much more needs to be done to ramp up the program. 
even today, a half a year after its reauthorization, fewer than half of states have a USDA approved implementation plan. Oops. Finally, um, it's not surprising to me, just going back to this turning point, that at the turning point, the turning point happened when the 15% maximum benefit increase to SNAP was implemented. Um, and while the SNAP benefit increase extension in the American Rescue Plan through the end of September is welcome, calendar-based deadlines are not optimal policy. And so a SNAP benefit increase should be continued as long as economic conditions warrant, which would improve SNAP as an automatic stabilizer and continue to support families as long as economic conditions warrant. Uh, thanks for having me. And I'm going to stop sharing and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Now we will hear from Mary. Thank you, Mary. Hi, and thanks a lot for the invite. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, I probably bring a slightly different uh, take to some of uh, the conversation because I'm, I'm, I do a lot of research around agriculture and food across the value chain. And uh, one of the things that we work on at the Interdisciplinary Center is really thinking how we can build resilient food secure communities, even though a lot of the things that we're doing right now are things that are helping food pantries and we're um, uh, build capacity to address these things. We're helping food banks um, think differently. We do a lot of research in that arena, but I also do a lot of research on the condition of the food system and what it looks like. And I think that is something that we have to address if we're going to really get to these um, um, food secure communities. And it comes back to something that Joel said, which is really thinking about building an inclusive economy that works for everyone. So in the food system, what we have is we have very powerful agribusiness that actually dominate many sectors of the food system from Walmart being a key player in grocery to um, uh, Bear being a, one of the key global players where about four firms control about 52% of the global proprietary seed trade. So you start to look at these very, you know, everything from the seed all the way to uh, where people buy their groceries, there's very few choices. There's a lot of constrained choices in that. And when there's not very many choices, farmers, workers, eaters don't have a lot of power. And I think that this is something that we really have to address if we're going to talk about um, resilience and we're going to talk about food secure communities. So the power of agribusiness right now, we saw um, particularly displayed in the meatpacking arena about what happened to uh, um, uh, meatpacking workers um, who are not the lowest paid workers, but they're not the highest paid workers. Meatpacking workers actually have lost a lot of purchasing power in the last uh, 30 years, but they also experienced high rates of COVID but um, they were, uh, because of the COVID, we had uh, shutdowns in, in processing plants. And those are just some of the kinds of disruptions that we saw in, uh, in getting food uh, to, to people um, across the board, not just to uh, food insecure people. Now, why can a you know, very powerful food chain, why can it break down so quickly under a pandemic? Well, it's because it's fragile. Right, And it's because ecologies, workers, farmers, communities are all interlinked in this. And if we're going to really build um, food secure communities, resilient food secure communities, we're going to have to pay attention to building opportunities in the food system for farmers, for workers to have livable wages. Right now, you know, Food Chain Workers Alliance will report that um, food chain workers, farm workers, food service workers, processing workers are among the uh, lowest paid uh, median and hourly wages across, across the board. So we have got to do something where we're thinking about um, uh, building mid-level kinds of food chains that, are, that have some redundancy built in them, but that offers 
jobs at the community level, that builds power back at the community level and builds power back for farmers and workers. So right now, we, we have a, a um, food system or a food chain that's dominated by a few um, agribusinesses. And they never return when they, um, they don't uh, deliver cheaper prices. Um, in fact, sometimes they deliver uh, higher prices uh, for, for um, food, but they don't offer good working conditions for farmers to make it a, a livable wage for um, workers to make a livable wage, especially those workers, <coughs> farm workers and um, the food processing workers. So I think that's where I come from thinking about how can we make a food system that is more competitive um, using competition policy perhaps to uh, really build a more uh, resilient, more uh, with more um, backup loops, uh, backup uh, strategies in place and things like that. So my, my position is that we really have to think about the food system structure, and I really like what Joel said about, what did you call it, a, a, a radical centrist kind of policy? And I kind of feel like I'm there too, in the sense that this is something that's important to uh, rural communities, it's important to urban communities, it's important to communities that can't have grocery stores because we have such huge um, um, concentration and consolidation in the in the grocery arena. So my little town of 350 people back in Nebraska where I grew up has a grocery store, but a lot of rural communities don't because they cannot compete in a um, uh, consolidated uh, food system. And that means that there's not as many jobs and we can go on and on. So really, if we think about a food system that is built at the local and regional scale that really addresses um, food needs at the local and regional scale, that's going to take a lot of policy approaches from a lot of different perspectives. And I think that's really important to highlight. Wonderful. Thank you, Mary. Um, that was very interesting. So um, thank you to all three of our panelists, to Joel, Lauren, and Mary. Um, I will, uh, I have questions for each of you. Um, and then I'm sure maybe uh, Will and Crystal might have some too. Um, but, you know, in terms of all of my questions, um, I might direct them at one of you, but uh, other panelists feel uh, free to weigh in as well. Um, Mary, I, I know from your bio that you um, spent some time in Iceland. Are there any lessons from abroad um, that you've come across in that work or in your research that you think we can import for our own approach to uh, food policy? Well, actually, Iceland is very interesting because it's a really expensive place to live. Um, so it has pretty expensive food, right? But the, I did not see the levels of food insecurity in a place like Iceland that, that we see in, in, in the U.S. And part of it's because of job security. It's because um, there's a lot of things that work um, as a public good in Iceland, including healthcare and um, a, a lot of worker rights. So there are a lot of approaches to the larger economy that really protect against food insecurity, even though they're an island nation that depends a lot on imports, but they were using their natural resources to um, um, produce uh, food there year round. I was eating tomatoes and greens that were actually produced in Iceland, which you're like, what? But they use geothermal in, um, energy uh, to, to make the best use of their, their resources and they recognize that food's really important. Um, but it's this wraparound policies. It's not just food policy, it's employment policy, it's trade policy, it's um, worker policies. So all of those things are really important. And can I just say, we're, you know, I agree with all that. We're the only Western industrialized country pre-COVID that had even close to this level of poverty and hunger. And some people say, oh, it's inevitable part of our size or diversity. And I say poppycock. Uh, and you know, Scandinavia is a good example. If you've read Scandinavian uh, literature, as I have, including Iceland and Scandinavia, uh, if you've viewed visual arts from Scandinavia, where you see you know, bread lines throughout 
there was a boatload of poverty in Scandinavia in the 19th century, a boatload of hunger. And it wasn't an area that had particularly civil war or religious wars or political oppression, but billions of people left there to come to North America because it was horribly in, impoverished. There's even you know, a town outside of Winnipeg, that, uh, Canada, that was settled by uh, Scandinavian, uh, by uh, Icelandic Icelanders, you know, yeah. emigres, fun little you know, fact there. And, and, you know, and they weren't exactly going there for the better weather. It was equivalent or colder than you know, a, of Scandinavia. And you go to those countries today and they basically, they still have some problems, but they don't have endemic, you know, massive poverty and hunger. And with the exception of, of uh, Norway, what got oil, you know, Iceland, other than geothermal power, you know, certainly Sweden and, and Denmark and Finland didn't have a significant change in their natural resources. They decided to change their government policies. And I will say, you know, we're all concerned that, you know, that you know, as I said, work should pay when those countries, they actually have a higher workforce uh, participation rate than in the United States. So the claim by the right that if you have stuff like child care and health care, people will be too coddled to work is, is preposterous. Thank you. Um, my uh, second question is for um, Joel. Um, so the, the Congresswoman uh, Bonamici mentioned um, that there have been a lot of innovations um, in terms of how we feed people during the pandemic. Um, have you seen any at the state or local level that you think um, are, are ones that should be a lesson learned for going forward and are uh, potentially scaled? Yeah, first I should say that between 90 to 95 percent of all the money spent fighting hunger in America is originally federal, and that's including the charitable programs when you factor them in. The federal safety net is underutilized as it is, is, is actually 15 times the dollar amount of all the food distributed by every charity in America. So in, in New York, in New York City, you know, I've more than my share of issues with our mayor, as do most people, but on hunger, he did a, a really good uh, job. They uh, not only opened up many schools as grab and go sites for children, but they said uh, parents can eat along with the children which was very different than the status quo. And they did this, frankly, even before they knew whether they were gonna be reimbursed by the federal government for that. They eventually were through FEMA. And they also developed a, uh, a, uh, a home delivery program that at its peak delivered a million meals a day to homebound uh, people, people with compromised immune systems who had limited mobility. And so that really reduced uh, the interactions that would have led to the spread of COVID and, and reduced hunger. And lastly say there's a lot we can learn from our, for our HOPE proposal from New York City. They are ahead in much of the country uh, in terms of uh, being able to apply for various benefits online. In New York City, you can use your smartphone to not only submit your SNAP application, but to submit your accompanying documents. Many of us, when we deposit you know, paper checks, if we still get them, we take it with our smartphone and deposit in our bank. You can do that with SNAP documents in New York. So there are you know, things happening around the country, but I caution a lot of people think we, we can have a hunger-free community, and I don't think that's possible without a hunger-free America. We have a national economy. We have national programs. If you do make, uh, let's say, Milwaukee hunger-free, uh, its population of poor people will triple overnight because everyone will go there with food, and so there's no around the fact that we do need national working policies. Sure. Mary, go, you can add that right in. I just wanted to say about the, the online too. Um, I think that it's a really, um, uh, we have to address a lot of um, policies around this too, because in rural areas, we have very limited uh, broadband in many areas, right? And so you can't get, you can't get online, you can't. So some of these residents are feeling really left out by, um, you know, by, by some of the online banking and, online um, innovations that we've seen. So I think that that's really important to address as well. But again, it's this wraparound. We have to talk about wrapping all of these things around. I mean, we had rural people that couldn't get um, online, but they also couldn't get to an office during the pandemic, right? So we had food pantry directors who are all volunteer out in rural areas, food pantry folks help trying to help people um, get online to do banking and things like that because they couldn't access it like, uh, like, 
I could in even in Iceland, I could access everything in the US that I needed because of course they even living in a rural area, they had very good um, internet access. So I think again, it's all these wraparound things that we really have to pay attention to. Thank you, Mary. Um, and so my, my last uh, just direct question to the panel, um, this one's for Lauren. Um, so the pandemic obviously dominates a lot of our discussions of policy going forward as it should, but are there any, any other long-term priorities um, that you think should be top of mind uh, with regard to the, the Biden administration as COVID wanes hopefully in the coming year? Sure, I think that they've, um, they've set priorities that I would set as well um, on a couple of areas. And there are certainly some places um, that are, are farther down the road. And, and all of these things I think could happen without congressional action, though certainly there are some reauthorizations um, that are on the table that matter. Um, and the, the top one is reforming the thrifty food plan to increase um, the adequacy of the baseline maximum SNAP benefit. There's a variety of ways that we can do that now that Congress has said that USDA can look at this every five years. Um, and top of mind for me, and I think this is really relevant to what's happening um, to all of us, especially mothers of young children during the pandemic, is accounting for the cost of time and the SNAP benefit. Um, it is just untenable that we do not um, account for that when we are um, calculating the maximum SNAP benefit. Um, and certainly there are ways to do that without congressional authorization directly. And I think USDA should take that up. Um, the other piece I would say on the long-term um, agenda for me just to raise um, is really rethinking work requirements um, in the SNAP program, not just for able-bodied adults without dependents, but also for students. Um, they just represent an unnecessary barrier to a variety of people who, even when economic conditions are good, struggle to maintain consistent attachment to the labor force. Um, and they take away, you know, one of the only programs for which they are sort of universally eligible. And so uh, my sort of reach goal here beyond the things that the Biden administration has already said and beyond the pieces that Congress um, is, is about to take up is to really rethink um, the work requirements for, for those populations. They don't work. Um, they present unnecessary barriers to entry. And um, if we want to seriously address food insecurity issues, not only among children, which I think is focal right now, but for anyone who's struggling, starting there is a good place. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Will and Crystal, before we uh, turn to the to the audience uh, Q&A, do you have any questions you want to uh, throw at the panel? Am I still muted? Uh, yeah, um, I thank you. You twist my arm, Veronica. I do have a question. In fact, I have a lot, but I'll just ask one quick one. Uh, Lauren, you mentioned, I think, in, almost in passing, the counter cyclical impact of food spending. That is, you know, it, it, it pushes back, uh, you know, it, it, it pumps up demand and uh, helps us recover. And Joe, you might have some thoughts on this too, but I'm just struck by how to, how, how to that's become. That is, it's become uh, one of the principal ways that social policy really plays an important counter, you know, economic role in downturns. And it seems as though, uh, Joel, that in the wake of, you know, welfare reform as it happened in the nineties, I know that's controversial, but it, it, it does seem like uh, food support has become, you know, maybe, you know, that counter cyclical logic has become an important factor in the growth of foods. I'm sure hunger is the other important factor, but it, it's just become an important tool in, in, um, in countering downturns uh, and is more valued, I hope, across the political spectrum as a result. I'm not so sure about that last point, but uh, it, it ought to be. Any comments on that? I guess I'll, I'll go. So without, you know, relitig relitigating the 1996 welfare reform leg legislation, uh, but as you know, Will, uh, Bill Clinton vetoed two previous versions of the bill uh, before he signed the third version. A lot of people wiped that out of the history entirely. And uh, the two key reasons he vetoed the two previous versions is one is that it didn't include enough money for childcare and two that they eliminated SNAP what was then called food stamps and its entitlement program and even as he agreed that TANF cash assistance should no longer be a title entitlement program and I understand why that's still controversial today I get that but a lot of people ignore how much EITC payments increased during that time 
But uh, without focusing on that, the importance of SNAP maintaining its entitlement status can't be overstated. It's worked exactly as designed. Countercyclical is a wonkish term, but what it means is it's supposed to increase and spending is supposed to increase when the economy is bad and it's supposed to increase, decrease when the economy is good. And in 2008 and 2009, after the economic collapse, SNAP skyrocketed upward. It stayed high because hunger and food insecurity were still high until about 2015, then it started edging down and then really started going down in, in you know, 17, 18, and, and, and 19, when uh, wages went up, right? Poss partially because some states raised their minimum wage, partially because of a strong economy, and now it's skyrocketing up again. And not only is it important in terms of fighting hunger, as you said, it is a key economic investment. Mark Zandi is the chief economist at Moody's Analytics, not exactly a Marxist-Leninist, has said that SNAP is one of the best economic in, uh, you know, uh, incentives in the economy because food is by and large produced and manufactured and sold in America, creating American jobs. That's right. And I think, you know, one of the things that is really important, not just about like, why, why, let's step back and say, why is SNAP so effective? And it's, as Joel says, because, you know, a dollar spent on federal things, it generates a dollar 70 in economic activity. And it's because it's all local and the money just goes around, but it also because it's incredibly well targeted. Um, and, you know, that I think is one of the things about the American Rescue Plan writ large, um, that SNAP is a predictor for just, it is going to be money that goes to low income households who not only need the money, but who are going to spend the money very quickly. And so if we're trying to put together an economic package um, that is going to juice the economy as soon as the virus is under control and really slingshot into a self sustaining recovery, you give the money to low income people and you spend a lot of money on SNAP. Um, and so I'm, I'm heartened to see um, that SNAP in addition to the child tax credit and pandemic EBT, those are all pieces that are going to be really fighting the food insecurity crisis among children, but also really investing in the American people and the American economy to get us back on track. The only thing I would cut, and I'm not the policy, um, I, I am not nearly as versed in policy as my co-panelists here. So, but one of the things I think is important to remember is that food security is incredibly nuanced as well, right? So in Missouri, if uh, it's the housing costs outside of St. Louis that are a problem, while it's, um, you know, lack of good jobs that are um, different in, in, in the Ozarks, right? So we, it's a very nuanced kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of competing, it's health issues, it's, um, it's housing things. There are, that, that cause people to, um, you know, limit their, their uh, food consumption too. And so um, I think that it's important to realize that while, you know, SNAP is really absolutely critical and that like the, the double up bucks programs with SNAP are really good at also being helping create new kinds of food systems. We also have to think about all of the, you know, like the health care, the child care, the housing care, all of these things that are also uh, contributing to the household's decision on how they, they, they spend their resources. And, and, and so SNAP alone won't cut it, right? I think it's really important, but it alone won't cut it. Great, thank you all. Will, do you have any other uh, follow-up questions for the panelists? Yeah, there's a there's a question in the chat that I, we definitely wanna uh, make sure gets in here. Um, and then I, I do have a question, so I'm not, but I, I wanna get the audience question in here. It says, is there an orientation with regards to policy proposals that address the need to go to more plant-based diet to assist with climate change issues associated with animal agriculture? And it refer, references uh, Bill Gates's new book. And I think Mary, you said you wanted to tackle that one. Yeah, I can. Um, so while we definitely need to rethink um, diets across the board in terms of and what their impacts might have on ecologies, the singling out of the livestock industry without understanding some of the nuances within the livestock industry. I, I mean, I, I don't think a plant based diet at an individual level is going to solve our climate change issues from agriculture, right? It's, um, we have to think about it from what's, you know, 
are there ways that we can produce meat that are more resilient, that can provide um, um, some carbon sequestration? Because there's some indication that, that the how is really as important as the what. So I think that, that we have to, again, it's complex. The food system is complex. There are multiple strategies, multiple ways. We don't have one right answer. And every time we make an intervention, then, then it changes. And so um, engaging farmers, engaging communities across the board, not just saying, writing a book saying, this is what we got to do, but really thinking through what it means at the grassroots level in all different kinds of places, I think are, is really important. Great. In answering that question and sort of tackling that, so all of you have sort of um, referenced sort of the magnitude of the issue, right? That there are various levers to be pushed, whether it's on the, the advocacy side, the legislative side, uh, state and local, federal. Um, is there a conversation to be had about really in some way in these taking a ground up and top down approach, right? So from the ground up, a conversation around how do we codify the roles of individuals responsible for food strategies within regions, right? So I know that there, there's a piece of that that, that at USDA, but is there something, is there a role for state and locals to play in that same conversation, part one? Part two is we've got two big pieces of legislation coming out, right? The child nutrition reauthorization, somewhere in there is gonna happen, um, and Farm Bill. Historically, they've been bipartisan, you know, pieces of legislation ultimately, do you foresee with this current structure of Congress that that's still gonna be uh, how it's gonna move forward and what do you think the prospects are? This is for everybody. Joel, I know you want so to. So I'll, 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 I'll try to be <laughs> polite and I'll go first. So first, the, one of the things we're, we've, you know, asking the Biden administration to look at, and I know other people like Chef Jose Andres are talking about this, and Chef Tom Colicchio and Congressman, you know, Jim McGovern and the Tough School of Nutrition, all to take a broader view of food and food systems work. And that, uh, you know, I know Tom Vilsack a bit, and I have great confidence in him, but this goes way beyond USDA. Every domestic agency has a role to play in food from, you know, the Department of Justice, to where are they buying their food for federal prisons to is the Department of Labor uh, letting unemployed people know they can get snapped to what's the Department of Education doing to promote school meals you know etc and how this ties into small business development uh, I wrote a paper for PPI a longer time ago now on food jobs and it's more relevant now than ever how you know the federal government needs a comprehensive strategy to promote you know local and regional food processing and I think states particularly have a role to play that in New York we help Help get the state of New York, the governor, to create a food policy task force to you know, integrate these urban, rural, and suburban needs. And I think every state in the country should have a cross-agency state plan. Uh, New York City now has a, you know, a food policy office that are urging. I think every city should have that. And we really have to look at food as a broader issue beyond hunger to include nutrition and, and job creation and, and health and, 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 and safety, et cetera. Uh, and uh, in terms of the next farm bill, uh, it will only be partisan, nonpartisan if the nature of the Republican Party changes. That's about uh, you know, all, all I can say. This used to be a nonpartisan issue. Bob Dole was a great champion of anti-hunger programs. Richard Nixon was a great champion. Dick Lugar, Thad Cochran, some great you know, Republican champions in the Senate. Uh, but out of the few hundred Republicans in the House and the Senate, not one of them can find it within themselves to vote for a, a, the bill that just passed that would have dramatically reduced hunger in America. Every Democrat in the Senate voted for it, including Joe Manchin, uh, all but two Democrats in the House voted for it. So we're not a partisan group, but we don't have to pretend we don't see what's going on. I think the child nutrition bill is more likely to be bipartisan than a farm bill, just because people who hate SNAP for adults uh, are some somewhat more uh, understanding of food for kids. And I wanted to jump in here and say, um, I, I think what Joel's saying about the integration of food policy across the um, every part of government and every level of government is absolutely critical. My colleagues, uh, Shoshana Inwood and Jill Clark at Ohio State have uh, really looked at emergency management and how that's impa uh, been impacted around food issues. 
in the pandemic. And really one of the things we're thinking about is food policy is complex. People don't understand it in lots of different places. Really an administration at the federal level probably needs to almost have a food roundtable or a food czar kind of thing. And they could look at this from the, the local level where the food policy networks that have formed across the country um, from New York City all the way to like places like Salina, Kansas have really accomplished some really interesting things um, at the local policy level. Um, there's lots of different ways they're organized. There's lots of uh, things that they do. And I think that we could look at those innovations. They include a lot of stakeholders. They bring a lot of things forward that we could look at those in innovations for, uh, for policy responses in the future. Sure, I think, you know, I think we've learned a lot over the past year about how to do some of these things better. And I hope that those lessons are incorporated into whatever reauthorizations we're going. And I'll give a couple of examples. So one, um, and this I believe relates to a question in the comment, you know, we can do longer recertification periods and let people stay on programs longer because if you became eligible in the first place, we wanna give you a long lead time to get back on your feet. And I think that's a good lesson learned. Um, certainly um, not just in SNAP, but in WIC, you know, barriers to getting onto the program and easing them and easing some of these administrative hurdles, I think we should just do all the time. Um, and there's no reason to be in a public health crisis to make it, um, to, to justify making it easier to get onto programs for which you qualify. Um, and then the third piece, and I think this is, you know, more sensitive perhaps, is thinking about um, EBT solutions for families with kids for more than just um, the pandemic. I think the time for some year EBT all the time has come. And certainly, you know, I'm open to continuing having prepared meals um, at, at summer sites where there's programming involved, but take up rates are low. Um, and it's just, it's not justifiable at this point to know how effective these EBT solutions are and not have them be on the menu of options for families as they try to feed their kids whenever schools aren't in session. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, I, I know that um, Lauren, you're a huge proponent of um, pandemic EBT having uh, long uh, standing power after even- um, Forever, we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna rename it. Um, and uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna kick in whenever, whenever kids aren't in school. <laughs> Let me just say we overcomplicate this. Giving hungry people food makes them less hungry and we shouldn't be shocked by that. <laughs> And when you give people money to buy groceries, they buy groceries. Or waste it on something like rent. <laughs> Not terrible. <laughs> Um, well, well, I almost just want to end it on that note because I, I feel like that uh, just really gets to the bottom of it. Um, but Crystal, do you have anything else that you want to add? No, I'm fine. I, I think we've covered, there's a couple of questions, but I think we covered it in terms of whether summer EBT should be a permanent program. I think you all have sort of yeah, I think there's a yes on that one, so. <laughs> Can I just say, someone asked about uh, work and SNAP, and I think now that they clarify it, there is an issue with the benefit cliff that we progressives need to deal with, uh, particularly if the minimum wage doesn't go up to 15, but goes up to some mid-level, like 12 or 13 in some states. There will be particularly single adults without kids uh, that don't benefit from EITC payments that will actually lose more in benefits than they gain in wages. And that is a massive failure of American social policy if, if people lose the ability to feed their family by getting paid more at work. And so we, we do need a comprehensive plan to fix that. The Paul Ryans of the world talked about that a lot. And then their policies actually would do the exact reverse of what they talked about. We need to do this for real. Great. Well, um, we are almost at time, but I want to um, just take a moment to thank um, our impressive panelists for all of their thoughts. I feel like this has been a really stimulating discussion and, and there's a lot to take away for how we go forward um, out of the pandemic. Um, and, and thank you to everyone for joining. Um, take care and have a great afternoon. <laughs>